Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high quality racing oil for your two stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at Suzuki's all-new RM250 for 2001. Now, this is a very important machine in motocross history. It's really the last generation that uh, Suzuki built, at least uh, unless they decide to make it two strokes again. You know, fingers crossed, but probably not very likely. Uh, this is a complete redesign of the RM250, uh, a really, really big shift from the mid-90s ones uh, that I think had some supporters early on, and it kind of soured over time. Uh, but this bike... I think is really beloved. It's certainly one of the thought of as one of the machines this generation in particular of RM is one of the most like quote unquote two stroke uh, of the two strokes. It really kind of highlighted all the things that people love about two strokes. It also kind of embodied some of the things that people don't love about two strokes. It was a very hyperactive machine, but super fun to ride. I had a 2006 RM250, uh, a similar machine to this. Obviously, they made some refinements over the years, but uh, there wasn't like a total uh, change between 06 and 01. The bike was super fast, hard hitting, fun to ride, but also terrified me at times. It was very twitchy and kind of, like I said, hyperactive. I always felt like uh, the bike was a, a little ahead of me at times and what it was doing. And I found it less, I guess, comforting to ride than like my YZ250 and some other machines I've had. I know a lot of guys love these bikes. I imagine they were probably super fun on a Supercross track. I never raced Supercross, but outdoors, I always thought the bike was a little, little too twitchy for my taste. But I love the looks of them. They're super fun bikes. I remember when I first saw this uh, brand new O1 uh, at my local store here in Frederick, Maryland, JT Motorsports. I walked in and they had like the 2000 and they had the 2001 like right next to each other. And it was like eye popping how different they looked. The 2000, the, the yellow, which I always thought was a good look, uh, the old yellow was like, you know, really, really kind of plain looking compared to this new yellow. Uh, it was like, it looked like it was neon. It was so bright. And then that, uh, that new competition yellow was like a really different color than the old one. And it really stood out. You know, you saw them back to back with each other. It was uh, quite a shocking change. And I love the style. I think the styling even today looks great. I mean, you see people that do like, you know, modern restyled kits and stuff on them. But I think the stock uh, 2001 RM250 still looks great. I mean, it's incredible how, in my opinion, at least how modern the bike still looks, you know, after 25 years. Uh, of being out. It's it's kind of crazy how those bikes have held up in terms of the styling on them. I think they've done real well. If you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. I've done uh, coverage of all kinds of uh, different motocross and off-road machines, ATVs as well. Uh, I haven't been putting out a lot of videos lately because I work has been taking up all my time, uh, so I haven't had the time to devote to this kind of stuff, but I hope to get back doing some more videos here shortly. So if you do have anything in particular you'd like me to cover, just let me know in the comments section below. If you like to support what I do, I do have Motocross Vault merch available. I'll put a link to my Teespring account here in the video. I have designs that cover all the major manufacturers, different brands. If you want something custom, I'm happy to do that too. Just hit me up in the comments or drop me an email at uh, tblazer at gmail.com or the motocross vault at gmail.com and you can uh, just let me know kind of what you want. I can do a custom truck, a custom bike, graphics, whatever. Happy to accommodate you in that way. Uh, so here without further ado is a look back at Suzuki's all new 2001 RM250. The late 90s were a bit of a mixed bag for Team Suzuki in the 250 class. In 1996, Roger DeCosta and his crew had released an all new RM250 to much press acclaim. The redesigned machine featured all new styling, a Honda-like layout, and Super Trick Shawa conventional forks. Several magazines picked it as the top 250 of 1996 due to its excellent forks, crisp handling, and snappy power. On the professional front, the arm was still a work in progress in 1996, but Greg Albertini and Mike LaRocco were able to card wins at Unadilla and Wachugal on their factory machines. Over the next few years, however, public opinion seemed to sour somewhat on the new RMs. The innovative Shawa conventional force continued to garner rave reviews, but the arm's motor and shock settings proved disappointing when compared to its rivals. High-profile disagreements within the factory team and an unsuccessful Supercross title defense by Jeremy McGrath after his last-minute switch to Suzuki further put a negative spotlight on DeCoster's yellow machines. In 1999, Suzuki retired their conventional fork experiment despite the praise the forks had received from average riders and the press. Pro riders never gelled with the flexier feel, and Shawa found it difficult to justify the cost of developing a separate fork system that none of its other partners were adopting. In their place, Suzuki installed a new 49mm Shawa inverted twin chamber fork, revised shock valving, enlarged radiators and shrouds, 
and a slew of motor tweaks that were designed to up the RM's competitiveness for 1999. On the track, the 99RM's motor performance was much improved, but most people felt the old forks were superior performers. The motor's unique internal water pump continued to disconcert some with its odd clatter, and not everyone was on board with the look of the gargantuan radiator shrouds. For most riders, the RM's light and nimble handling continued to be its most appealing feature. For the 2000 season, Suzuki looked to refine their proven RM250 platform. In 1999, Greg Galbertine was able to finally capture his long-sought 250 National Motocross title for the brand, and most riders felt the RM was competitive with its rivals. For 2000, Suzuki dialed up a slew of motor and suspension refinements while maintaining the basic 99 package. The revamped motor was long on snap but short on breadth, with a hard-hitting mid-range but little else. A new shock and reinforced frame delivered improved action out back, but the Sha-1 inverted forks failed to match their action up front. Overall, it was a fun machine to ride, but its unbalanced suspension and narrow power limited its appeal as a racer. After five years in the market, it was finally time to introduce an all-new RM250 in 2001. The new machine was redesigned from the ground up, with an eye towards reducing weight, improving ergonomics, and boosting power. To accomplish these goals, Suzuki looked at every facet of the outgoing design and made changes to reduce size, shave weight, and improve overall performance. The motor, frame, suspension, and bodywork were all new, featuring radically restyled lines and a bold new color palette. The marble science yellow Suzuki had been employing on their arms for over a decade was retired and replaced with an all-new shade Suzuki coined Competition Yellow. This quote-unquote next-generation neon yellow positively glowed when placed next to the older RMs and helped reinforce the impression that this was a radically updated machine. Underpinning the redesigned RM was an all-new frame that was stronger, lighter, and more compact than the 2000 design. The new frame remained crafted out of steel but featured an all-new layout that combined some of the features of a traditional and a perimeter frame design. At the front, the redesigned frame was thoroughly conventional, with a large single backbone and single down tube that split into a dual cradle below the motor. Towards the rear of the backbone, however, the frame split and resembled a Kawasaki design with large stamped steel spars on each side. This quote-unquote semi-perimeter configuration was engineered to provide a strong and flex-free feel while avoiding the wide steering head and midsection that had plagued Honda and Kawasaki's early perimeter frame designs. In addition to the unique frame construction, the new RM's chassis featured a complete rethinking of the machine's weight balance and flex characteristics. Both the forks and main frame down tube were reduced in size, while the rear of the frame was strengthened around the swing arm and shock mounting. The new frame featured revised geometry with a shortened wheelbase, an increase in rake, and an extension in trail. Restyled bodywork slimmed the midsection and narrowed the tank and radiator shrouds considerably. The new pilot's compartment was flatter on top and featured a sit-on rather than sit-in feel that made it easier to move fore and aft and weight the front end in turns. New fenders front and rear featured a more angular look with cooling vents incorporated into the front and handholds built into the rear. In addition to being brighter in color, all the plastic was thinner as well to save weight. The foot pegs were relocated 9mm higher and 9mm rearward to complement the new flatter riding position. A new alloy subframe was designed that was lighter by one quarter of a pound. Altogether, the new frame and subframe added up to a two pound savings over the 2000 design. On the motor front, the RM250 was just as all new for 2001. The redesigned power plant retained the cylinder read intake the RM250 had employed since 1996, but added all new cases and a redesigned top end. The reconfigured bottom end moved the water pump back outside the cases, which allowed Suzuki to both shorten the motor and make servicing and replacement easier. The new cases were nearly an inch shorter than in 2000, contributing to better mass centralization. The motor retained the same 66.4 by 77 millimeter bore and stroke for a total of 249 cc's of displacement as 2000, but all new porting was added for improved power. The cylinder liner was plated with Suzuki's SCEM composite coating to provide the best combination of durability, lightweight, and heat conductivity. The redesigned top end was smaller and lighter with thinner walls, reduced bolt sizes, and a more compact layout. An all-new power valve system was added that moved from a one-piece, one-stage mechanism to a two-piece, two-stage design to provide more precise control and smoother power delivery. The ignition was all-new for 2001, with a smaller and lighter rotor and a new throttle position sensor that was integrated into the carburetor to provide the most precise ignition timing control. Both the transmission and clutch were also put on a diet, with a one-piece steel push rod of 2000 being replaced in favor of a new aluminum alternative. The primary drive gear was reduced in weight and a hollow shift shaft was used in place of the solid steel unit used in 2000. 
the shift mechanism was moved from a link type to a gear type for more precise engagement, and a new shift lever was bolted on with a revised shape and a hollow center for lighter weight and improved feel. Feeding fuel to the motor was an all-new intake, airbox, and carburetor. A new Kahin PWK38 carburetor was 16 millimeters shorter than the carb used in 2000 and featured the TPS integration needed to work with the new ignition and a power jet for improved low-end response. By working together, the carburetor and ignition could be fine-tuned to provide the best combination of spark and fuel based on engine RPM and the amount of throttle being applied. Paired with the new intake was a redesigned exhaust, which featured a reconfigured shape and thinner walled stampings to reduce weight. Combined with an all-new alloy silencer, the exhaust system dropped nearly two pounds of weight from the 2000 design. On the suspension front, the arm was once again majorly revamped for 2001. After using Shawa components for several years, Suzuki moved back to Kiaba on the RM250 for 2001. The all-new 46mm KYB forks were 3mm smaller in diameter than the old Shawa components and very similar to the forks found on Kawasaki's KX250. The new smaller diameter forks lowered the weight by 1.6 pounds and dialed back the rigidity of the arm's front end to better work with the flex characteristics of the all-new frame. Internally, the forks featured an air bladder and check to divide air and oil into two separate chambers. The air bladder was designed to increase pressure in the upper fork to hold back some travel in reserve to prevent bottoming on successive hits. In the rear, the RM once again moved to Kiaba for its suspension provider. The all-new KYB shock added high and low-speed compression damping control for 2001 to go with the full range of selectable rebound settings. The new shock was paired with a redesigned linkage and all-new swing arm design. To reduce weight, the upper shock mount was moved from a spherical bearing to a needle bearing and the shock body was reduced in diameter by 4 millimeters. This downsizing saved 0.57 pounds when compared to the 2000 design. All new brakes shaved weight by reducing the thickness of the rotors by 0.5 millimeters and increased the size of the venting on the front rotor. An all new one piece integrated rear master cylinder further saved ounces by reducing size and eliminating the need for a protective cover. Up front, Suzuki eliminated the plastic disc cover and reduced the width of the front hub by 20 millimeters. An all new brake pedal featured a revamped shape for improved feel and a one millimeter thinner construction for a 2.76 ounce savings in weight. Even the clutch and throttle controls were shaved, trimmed, and reworked to find additional ounces that could be shed. Redesigning the clutch perch and free play adjuster saved 2.6 ounces, and revamping the throttle cable mounting shed 0.79 ounces from 2000. All told, these changes added up to a remarkable 9 pounds of weight savings for 2001. On the track, the new look RM felt very different in some ways and largely unchanged in others. The new layout was ultra thin, but a good bit more cramped than previous RMs. The new bodywork and foot peg placement cut half an inch out of the reach from the seat to the pegs. While this made the bike feel very compact, many taller riders felt the updated ergonomics were a bit too cramped. While the layout was new, the RM's handling remained largely unchanged from the old design. At 222 pounds, the RM undercut every other machine in the class besides Honda's aluminum framed CR250, and its lightweight was apparent from the second you took the bike off the stand. In the air or on the ground, the RM was incredibly nimble, with a feathery feel that was more akin to a powerful 125 than a traditional 250. Turning remained excellent, and the RM had little trouble carving under its red, blue, green, and orange competition. Jumping the Suzuki was also a joy, and the bike could be whipped, flipped, and flattened like a BMX machine. As with previous RMs, however, stability was a bit of an issue. The bike danced around at speed and never fully felt planted to the ground. It rarely did anything truly scary, but it also moved around quite a bit more than many riders were comfortable with. The chassis felt like a cat poised to strike and ready to change direction and pounce it at a moment's notice. Many riders love this quick and responsive feel, but not everyone could come to terms with its hyperactive nature. Also playing into this hyper personality was the RM's new motor. The redesigned power plant provided a hard hitting and quick revving style of power that spooled up fast and blasted the machine out of every corner. The motor's light flywheel made it incredibly responsive to throttle input, but there was less traditional grunt down low than in the YZ, KX, and KTM. Most of its power was situated dead center in the mid-range, and the RM was incredibly quick once it hit the meat of its power band. Top end was rather unimpressive, however, and it was better to shift rather than try and scream it out of every corner. Selecting the proper gear and keeping a finger on the clutch were critical to making the RM's punchy but narrow power band work properly. This quick-hitting, rat-a-tat style of power was great on tight tracks, and the bike could be really fun to ride, but most racers felt the broad power of the Yamaha and the longer pull of the Honda were superior for racing. On the suspension front, 
The RM's all-new components offered tons of potential but lacked proper setup. The KYB forks were very similar to the units riders loved on the KX250, but the settings chosen for the RM proved too soft and underdamped for most riders' tastes. The soft stock springs and light damping control allowed the arm to blow through its travel on hard hits and hit a spike of valving in the mid-stroke. Big jumps left a strip of rubber under the front fender and only the slowest and lightest of pilots felt the stock settings were acceptable. The light stock damping caused the front end to dance around in small chop and this only exacerbated the arm's unsettled field speed. Installing stiffer springs and raising the oil level slightly helped alleviate the bottoming issues but the busy action and harsh damping spike in the mid-stroke required a revalve to fully address. In the rear, the new KYB shock was very plush and better received than the harshly damped front forks. Once again, the RM shared its shock with the KX250, but both machines provided a very different feel on the track. Where the KX was firm, the RM was soft, and this caused most riders to rate it below the Kawasaki in stock performance. While its settings were slightly soft, it did a better job of handling big hits and small chop than the front forks. Once again, a stiffer spring was advisable for fast guys, but the stock shock could be raced without any fear of the damper doing anything weird or beating you to death. On the detailing front, the arm was a definite improvement over previous Suzuki efforts. The new brakes worked very well, and the arm offered tons of power and excellent feel at the lever. All the controls were smooth in action, and the arm offered the lightest clutch pull in the class. Riders loved the slim feel and excellent ergonomics of the new layout. The bike was very comfortable and nothing got in your way or hindered your ability to put the arm exactly where you wanted it to be. Tall riders needed a taller seat, but overall the arm provided an excellent pilot's compartment. The new color freshened the arm's appearance and virtually everyone loved its brighter color palette and bolder styling. About the only complaint riders had with the arm's appearance was with the life of the stock graphics, which proved extremely short. Suzuki claimed at the time buyers swapped them out most of the time anyway, but they were still disappointingly fragile even by the lackluster durability standards of most OEM graphics. While they were still intact, however, they were handsome and a huge improvement over the weird ROM graphics used in 2000. As with most Japanese machines at the time, stock chain and sprocket life remained poor, and the stock steel bars were little better than butter and best replaced by aftermarket units as soon as possible. The new motor was no powerhouse, but with a bit of porting work it really came alive. Savvy tuners quickly found the RM's missing horses, and the bike could be quite potent with a bit of massaging. The move back to an external water pump also alleviated the annoying clatter that had been unnerving many riders since 1996. While the new clutch offered a light pull, its overall action and longevity were somewhat suspect. It was grabby when cold and tended to lurch and buck when it got hot. Switching to an aftermarket unit was advisable, for any clutch abusers who purchased the new RM. The shifting feel of the new transmission was smooth and light, but some riders did complain of annoying false neutrals if the gear lever was nudged by accident. This could be a serious safety concern, so care had to be taken not to kick it out of gear at an inopportune moment. Overall reliability proved good for an all-new design, but the RM tended to feel worn out far faster than any other machine but the KX. The graphics, seat, and switch gear all sacked out quickly, leaving the RM looking and feeling old before its time. In the end, the 2001 Suzuki RM250 proved to be a machine with tons of potential, but not enough polish. The new motor was snappy and fun, but often difficult to ride. The chassis continued to offer the lightest feel and sharpest turning in the class, but its mediocre suspension and wayward high-speed handling left many searching for a steering damper and a qualified suspension tuner. With a bit of motor massaging and some suspension work, the 2001 RM250 could be a world beater, but in stock condition, it was a pretty princess in need of a trip to finishing school. So there you have it. That's a look back at the all-new 2001 Suzuki RM250, a machine that certainly was very competitive in the early 2000s. You know, by 2005, a lot of people would say it was maybe uh, number one or even certainly a, a close number two to the YZ250 in this era. The early on ones maybe had a little, you know, suspension issues and stuff. They need to be sorted out. But the basic DNA of a great motocross machine was there. And I think, again, Suzuki really knocked it out of the park with this design. If you get on the bike now, it's like super narrow and slim, great ergonomics, super fun to ride, and like very fast. That There's no doubt that these bikes had plenty of power. Um, this 01, you know, the power man is a little narrow, but I think it got better a little bit over time. They made some massages to the motor and what have you. But the basic DNA for a great Supercross title winning machine was, uh, you know, started here in 2001. And I think uh, the reason that people think so fondly of these machines, you know, is part of that. Re it was really a good DNA and design there. It's very lightweight. Like, so they shaved like nine pounds off the bike, which is crazy, all the little steps they made to 
uh, save ounces here and there and how it added up with a really, really lightweight, fun bike to ride. Uh, if you like this sort of thing, make sure, again, you check out my other videos on the channel. I would love you to let me know if you want me to do something specific in the future. Just drop me a line. Let me know. I'm happy to see if I can accommodate you with all the research I have here. Hopefully, I'll find a little more time to do some more regular videos, at least try and get it out once a month, hopefully, moving forward if uh, work doesn't keep me so crazy. So until we meet again, this is the Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.